Well, welcome to our online service today, recorded for the 12th of July 2022. During our service, we'll be hearing from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32, the prodigal son, which I'll be preaching on, and also we'll be having prayers and readings by Dave and Kathy Devereaux. So we're going to start our service by singing together before the throne of God. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. The great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me then depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, up would I look and see him there who make an end to all my sin. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. The just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen land, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. by his blood my life is hid with Christ on high my Christ my Savior and my God with Christ my Savior and my God I now before the cross of Christ and marvel at his love divine God's perfect son was crucified to make my righteous in God's eyes this river's depths I cannot know, but I can glory in his blood. The Lord most high has bowed below, and poured me with his precious blood, and poured on me his glorious love. Hello boys and girls, this is a story that was told by Jesus. Jesus told this story to some church leaders who were grumbling and complaining. The reason they were upset because Jesus had been kind to people who didn't deserve it. See if you can work out why Jesus told this story. There was once a man. He had two sons. One day the younger son said, Dad, can I have my inheritance now? I don't want to wait. I want it now. And his dad agreed and gave his son the money. Quickly the youngest son packed up his clothes, grabbed the money and left. He travelled to a distant country and began to party. He made lots of friends very quickly. He spent lots of money very quickly. He ran out of money very quickly. And he lost his new friends very quickly. A great famine hit the land and the food was hard to find. The only job he would get was feeding pigs. He was very sad. He was very hungry. He was so hungry he thought about eating the pig's food. Things were not good. One day he thought to himself, My father has servants and they have food. I will go back to my father. I will say I was wrong. I don't deserve to be called your son. Just let me be your servant. So he started back home. When he was still a long way from home, his dad saw him coming. His dad ran out to him. His dad hugged him. But the youngest son fell to his knees and said, Dad, I have done the wrong thing against you and against God. 
I don't deserve to be your son. But his dad wouldn't listen. His dad put new clothes on him and his dad gave him a big party. But the oldest son became angry. He spent all day working hard in the hot sun and he refused to join the party. The father found the eldest son and said, Come and join the party. You have been with me and everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate because your brother has returned. He was dead to us, but now he is alive. He was lost, but now he is found. The younger son did not deserve his father's kindness, but his father welcomed him back with open arms. Children, none of us deserve God's kindness, but God welcomes us into his family with open arms because of Jesus. How good is that? The elder son didn't think his younger brother deserved to be welcomed back. God welcomes people into his family, even people we don't think deserves it. So remember, God has been very kind to us. So don't be upset when God is kind to others. Celebrate when anyone comes to God because of Jesus. How good is that? Well, thank you for listening, boys and girls. There are some sheets you may wish to colour in when I'm talking to mums and dad a little bit later in the service. Thank you. The Old Testament reading is Hosea 11, 1 to 11. God's love for Israel. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realise it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt? Will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me God Most High, I will by no means exalt them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Admar? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come from Egypt trembling like sparrows, from Assyria fluttering like doves. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. This is the word of God. Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and earth against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son 
threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandal on his feet. Sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the eldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called to one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. If you have a Bible, it would be good to open it to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32, as we look at the parable of the lost son. Well, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We're able to open your word. Father God, we do pray your spirit will guide us in our understanding. Help us, Father, to see what it is you teach us. And Father God, help us to see how it applies to our lives. Help us, Father, to learn and to grow as your children. And we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know, as parents, you've ever faced a situation where you've lost a child in a shopping centre. Or maybe you can think back to a time in your own childhood when you were lost. I have a vague recollection of being lost with my sister in Maya in Melbourne when I was around about five years old. But we certainly faced the situation of misplacing a child. On one occasion, we were in South Headland. We were at the shopping centre there and we were doing some clothes uh, buying. We were living in Parabadu at the time and I think we were in Target or Kmart. I can't remember exactly. And uh, whilst we were looking for the clothes for the various children and we had four children there, we managed to lose Philip. They'd been playing games where they're hiding in the middle of the clothes racks and so we thought, well, he must be in one of those. But as we looked, we couldn't see him anywhere. So Anthea went to the front desk and they made an announcement about, has anyone seen a child? Well, after a frantic five minutes or so, someone brought Philip back from the other end of the shopping centre. He had left uh, Kmart or Target, whichever it was, and he'd gone down to the other end where he'd seen a ride that he'd liked. It was sort of a very terrifying time and a panicky time since we could not find him but for some people, that panic, that, that fear of losing a child is much more than just 10 or 15 minutes in a shopping centre. We've been fortunate that none of our children have run away, but that's been the experience of some parents. And when a child has gone, not just for overnight, but several days, that sense of panic increases. It's a very painful time. You may have seen on occasions where an appeal is put out over TV, for the child to return and the hope is that there'll be either a phone call or a knock at the door. For some there is hope but for others that that phone call, that knock at the door never comes. But they're always looking each day for that child to return. In Luke chapter 15 which we started to look at last week there are three stories about being lost. Last week we looked at the lost sheep and the lost coin. And as we noted last week, these particular parables were spoken into a a context in which the Pharisees were finding fault with Jesus. We saw last week that Jesus had been uh, engaged in conversation, indeed sharing meals with tax collectors and sinners. And rather than being pleased, the Pharisees of the teacher of the law were critical of Jesus. They said, why should he welcome such people? 
Surely if he was righteous, he would have realised how undesirable these people were. And so these three parables challenged the Pharisees about their attitude. Last week we saw that if the Pharisees weren't rejoicing, well, they were certainly rejoicing in heaven whenever one sinner repents. But today we're going to be looking at the third of those stories, the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. For this teaches not only the need for the lost to be found in the celebration that follows, but also deals more fully with the nature of God, his mercy, and also the problem of the Pharisees, their lack of mercy. Well, let's open up the word of God to, as said, Luke chapter 15, verse 11. In verse 11, we're introduced to the first son. As we read through, we are told that the man had two sons. We're not told anything about the second son at the moment. We're introduced to the younger one. And we see that the son was rebellious. He was one who wanted everything now. So in verse 12, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them, between the two sons. There was precedent for inheritance to be handed out early but what usually happened was the sons would uh, manage the property uh, they would all stay together and the father would accrue interest the younger son would receive one third and the older son two thirds but what is unprecedented here is the son wants to take all he has and leaves in effect he's saying to his father drop dead he was breaking up the family. He was only concerned about what he could have and how he could enjoy it. And so we see in verse 13 that not long after he had divided up the property, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. He said, went outside the country of his uh, parents, of in his inheritance, and we're told that when he gets there, he squanders his wealth in wild living. The son, having left, squanders what has been given to him. He abuses all that has been entrusted to him. He shows no care. He shows no worries. It is reprehensible what he is doing. But as often happens when people squander things, when there is a time of need, they find themselves short. And so having squandered his wealth in wild living, we see in verse 14 that finally he spends everything. And at that time, a severe famine happens. Now, no doubt when he had his money, he was hit to the party. Everyone wanted to know him. Everyone wanted to be his friend. Everyone wanted to be there when he was partying. But having now run out of money, we see that no one is there. No one cares. He is abandoned. We see that the severe famine comes to the whole country and he begins to be in need. It leaves him in a very difficult situation. Nobody wants to know him. And in the end, his solution is one which will lead to great humiliation. He hires himself out to one of the citizens of this country and he is to feed pigs. A number of things there would have led to humiliation. He was hired out in a foreign country. He didn't have the protection that was there for uh, Jewish people in their own country. There were laws that required that they were uh, protected even if they had to put themselves into slavery. There were limitations on what an owner or a master could do. But here he was now at the behest of a citizen of a foreign country. But even more than that, as a Jew, he was here now feeding pigs pigs that under the Jewish law were unclean. This was a great humiliation. He had gone from having what appeared to be everything now to having nothing. And it's at this low point that finally he, we're told in verse 17 that he comes uh, to his senses. At this time he realises what he has done. The plan he hatches is not one of thinking, well how can I get in my father's good books? But I think a real identification and acceptance that he had done wrong that he had called great harm and so he sees that when he comes to his senses here in verse 17 
Uh, he thinks about the situation, his father's household, his, how many of his father's hired men have food to spare, uh, that he realises that he had left a place of, of provision uh, now to, to be starving. But as I said, it wasn't about trying to work out how can I sort of wingle my way through. I think there's a real acceptance that he had sinned against his father. He said, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired hands. For many of us, we sometimes have to reach that low point before we're willing to admit we've been wrong, to come before God in repentance. There was no guarantee that when he got home, he would receive anything. Indeed, he may well have been met with, with anger and told to go away. But having decided that this is what he would do, that he's seen that his actions had effectively forfeited his right to be a son, in verse 20, he turns these, this resolution into action. We read there in verse 20 that, so he got up and went to his father. At this point, we wouldn't know what sort of reception he would get. We wouldn't be surprised if uh, he had got there and as said, was told, go on your Go on your way. We don't want you here. You've, you've got all that you deserve or all you are entitled to. But having been introduced, first of all, now to the rebellious son, in verse 20, we now see the merciful father. Look at what it says. But while he, that is the son, was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arm around him, and kissed him. First of all, we need to note that the father must have been looking to the horizon. The fact he picked up that while he was still a long way means he must have been every day looking out for his son. I began with the illustration about uh, a person who's had a child who's run away, uh, waiting there by the phone for a, a hopeful phone call or a knock at the door. Well, the same thing here with this, this father. He was looking to the horizon. Maybe today my son will return. Maybe today I'll see him again. And we see on this occasion, he sees him a long way off and he shows compassion. He didn't have to show acceptance to his son. This is totally about the nature of the father, a father who is merciful, a father who is compassionate. But having sort of com compassion, he didn't sort of say, oh, I'll wait here until my son gets here. But he leaves his house. We see that he runs to him. Uh, all decorum goes out of the out the window. He's not worried about what other people think. His love for his son is so great. His desire to show compassion means he did things that he shouldn't have done. I mean, an elderly man did not run. And yet he runs there. And when he gets there, he throws his arm around him and kisses him. He welcomes him home. Now, the son had already resolved he wants to repent. And so he starts to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the love of the father, the compassion of the father is so great that he actually doesn't focus upon that. He doesn't, in some ways, doesn't even hear it. That is not what he's responding to. He's not responding to the repentant and saying, well, now I'll accept you. His acceptance was there even before that. And so whilst his son is saying this, his father is saying to his servants, quick, Bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. There's a sense in which the son may well have come back almost like in rags. But his father wanted to put the sign of sonship back on him. To put the ring on, you're part of my family. To put the robe on, to say, you are welcome. To put the sandals on. And in verse 23, he orders that a fattened calf be killed and a feast to be celebrated. And we see here a parallel with the other parables, the celebration when even one repents, a celebration that what, what was once lost is now found. And we see that explicitly here in verse 24, for the son of mine was dead, is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they begin to celebrate. There's a real sense of resurrection. It had nothing to do even with the per the son's repentance, it was totally the father's mercy. 
Paul picks up on it in a very similar way when he writes Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead in your transgressions, but you're now made alive in Christ Jesus. We couldn't have turned it around. It wasn't our repentance that made us somehow worthy, but because of God's mercy, God who is willing to send his son to pay the price. We see here the son being restored, being put back in that place, a place which he did not deserve, all because of the merciful father. And so much more with our heavenly father, God who accepts us that while we're still enemies, Christ died for us. The heavenly father who welcomes us back, even though we have no call upon him. And so we get this wonderful picture of this merciful father looking out for his son, having seen him, runs out, welcomed him, kissed him, placed him back in his uh, position of being part of the family. But at the beginning of the parable, we're told this father had two sons. Now, the parable could have stopped at this point. It would have been very much parallel with the other two parables. But now in verse uh, 25, we're introduced now to the second son, the older son. And the older son is not so much a faithful son, although he had stayed and had served and kept up the role of being there on the property. But we see again, he is revealed as another rebellious son. Look what it says in verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. He was going about his work. This is what he's always done. And later on, he'll say to his father that, you know, I've done all you've asked of me. But as he comes near to the house, he hears the music and dancing. And he thinks to himself, that's strange. I didn't know my father was going to have a feast today. What was going on? What was special? Maybe some special guests has come from unexpectedly from out of town. And so he calls one of the ser servants over and asks him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he has replied. Your father has killed the fattened calf and he has come back safe and sound. And note the response of the older brother. This is why I'm saying he's a second rebellious brother. For in verse 28, the older brother becomes angry. He is upset with the father's willingness to accept his son back. As we see this resentment, this reminds us of the attitude of the Pharisees. Were they resentful that Jesus should eat with sinners and tax collectors? And so in the second son is not uh, a son who is like Jesus, but is actually like the Pharisees, still going about their role of, of doing their religious duty and yet being in many ways just as rebellious as the first son. We see it in the prophet Jonah, where God tells him, I want you to go to Nineveh to take this message. And he's angry when God forgives him. He sulks, we see in chapter four of Jonah. Why should God be merciful? I'm the one who's been faithful. Why has why he shown mercy to this lot who have done nothing? And so we see this rebellious son, but note we again see a merciful father. For as the son becomes angry, he refuses to go in. Look what it says in the second part of verse 28. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Again, we see a father who has been merciful. Come, celebrate. You have all, you know, I'm not cutting you off. But the son is still rebellious, still angry in verse 29. But he answers his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed you. But you have never given me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. I think that's probably an exaggeration. He's angry as such that he says, you've never given me anything. You haven't loved me. You know, sometimes children say, you don't love me. Or when we, we become blind to all the good things we have received, we only see the things we haven't got. And I think this is the case here with this son. I'm sure the father has indeed given times of celebration to him. But he is so angry that in his mind, God, the, the, son has shown, the father has shown him no um, generosity. Indeed, he goes on in verse 30, he says, well, this son of yours, this, this son of yours uh, has squandered your 
your property with prostitutes and comes home and you kill the fattened calf. And so this, this, this second son starts to disown. We, he, he shouldn't have anything to do with us. He's cut off. He, he might be you know, your son, this son of yours. And we see the father being very compassionate. In verse 31, my son, the father said, you're always with me and everything you have, I have is yours. But we must celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. He corrects the second son. You talk about this son of mine, but he is your brother. And I think it was very much aimed at the Pharisees. For those tax collectors and sinners were part of the people of God. And yet they've been cut off. Yes, there are consequences for what they have done. But God wants to show their mercy. And the Pharisees were unwilling. So too with this second son. It is right to rejoice when one who is lost has been found. And he encourages the son to be concerned for his brother. As we reminded last week, the Bible says we are all lost. We need to return to the father. But we also need to rejoice and be happy when others also return to the father. Sometimes as Christians, we again might be angry like this second son. I've always served God and God doesn't seem to have blessed me in a way that he's blessed this other person. They've been a Christian five minutes. They've done all these terrible things. And look what he's done and I haven't received those things. And so we need to be careful. We need to be careful. We don't become rebellious like the second son. Let us rejoice when one repents and let us welcome in all that God would call to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray that as we deal with people in our world, that we don't become resentful. It's very easy for us to look at others and say how terrible they are. And sometimes we might become resentful when they do come to faith. That somehow they've done so little and yet that God seems to have blessed them. And we can sometimes ignore the good things that God has given us. Help us, Father, to learn from this parable to be welcoming to those who are sinners, to pray they may come to Christ and let us rejoice along with the angels in heaven when they do and give thanks to God when he is generous to them as he has been to us. Well, let us now pray together a prayer of confession to acknowledge our need for God and to come to him. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and broken your laws. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you more and more. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, I thank you for all that you've done. You gave your son freely for me. And I praise you.
Considering Sunday's theme of the prodigal son, we will begin our prayers with the powerful lyrics from a song called Love Move First by Casting Crowns, which is a kind of response of praise and adoration for what God has done for us. What kind of grace, relentless grace, would chase this rebel down? Crawl into this prisoner's cage, take my hand and pull me out. You knew me, you knew I couldn't make the change, so you became the change in me. And now I live to tell the story of the God who rescues. You didn't wait for me to find my way to you. I couldn't cross that distance, even if I wanted to. You came running after me when everyone else would have turned and left me at my worst. Loved, move first. From the throne to the manger, from a manger to the grave, your cross is the proof love made the first move. From a grave meant to keep you to a stone rolled away, your grace is the proof love made the first move. Father, we come before your throne in adoration and awe of your love and mercy. That God Almighty might seek us out, even though we are rebels and enemies, so that we might become your children, joint heirs with Christ. That's amazing. What love, what grace, what mercy. And yet, Father, when we think about that, we also re- reflect on the incomprehensible price that our salvation was achieved through. It required your son to become a man, to experience an excruciatingly painful death, to be cursed all for us. And yet, his sacrifice has been vindicated by his resurrection. And now that he sits at your right hand, waiting to come again, which we'll reflect on later in the prayer. This is beyond a dream, Father. So in response to your great mercy and love, we know that you've called us to live for you, to imitate your son and to be your representatives on this earth. So on that note, Father, we pray for this world in light of your love and care for creation and humanity in general. We pray for wisdom and we pray for a right response to the impact and suffering associated with the COVID-19 virus. Pray for wisdom and policymaking. Pray for strength, comfort and protection for those that serve in the front line. And we pray for strength and comfort for those that have been impacted in such negative and serious ways by this virus. We pray for that. We uphold to you also in parts of the world where there is suffering, strife and war. Particularly think of the Middle East, for Africa and for Asia. We think of the dislocation of people that are escaping because of disease, economic factors and violence. Unrest in the in Hong Kong. Everything seems to be just a bit nutty, Father, at the moment. We look at some of the unrest that's occurring in the United States. And yet, Father, the great thing is, because your son is seated, we know that our hope is assured, that our future is firm, and that, Father, we can have absolute confidence uh, And you know, under Romans 8, 28, that your purposes are always for our good. And so we just, again, just thank you for your your mercy and your goodness to that to us and father we pray father for you will be with your people in this world that they might rightly reflect your grace and your love and your mercy we particularly think of those people um, who are living under oppression and are persecuted we pray you give them strength and grace and pray you'll be with organizations like Barnabas Fund that they might continue to seek to support and serve and care for your people And we continue to pray for people in Australia, Father, but particularly for decision makers across our land and all spheres of government. Um, We especially pray for your people, those Christians that are in places of leadership, of governance, of legal positions. Uh, We pray for courage. We pray for wisdom. We pray for faithfulness, that they might be witnesses for you in the place to which you've called them to be. So, Father, we also acknowledge that this is a difficult time because it's between Christ Firkin's first and second coming. And so we pray for the church across the world that we might be light and salt in this world, that we might be about your purposes and seek to live out your will in faithfulness to your word. 
that we might proclaim with confidence and consistency and congruence, congruency your gospel. And that in doing so, we might betray Christ to the world for the way we relate and the way we respond. And so we also continue to pray for revival and renewal in your church. And that means in our own individual lives that we might reflect in increasing measure the character of Christ in all we do. And so we come to you with some points in the newsletter, confident that you do hear us. And we continue to pray for families, that they may be encouraged to bring up their children in the ways of the Lord. We pray for for the youth group and for the leaders involved. We pray for where's as he ministers to our young people. Continue to pray for Caitlin Healy and her husband. It's probably not Caitlin Healy now, but for her studying at SNBC in Sydney, that you'll be with both the, the couple and that you'll help them to grow in their knowledge of you and prepare for whatever ministry that you have before them. Pray for growth, growth groups, for leaders and members of the church as they grow together. And we pray for the formation of new groups. Continue to pray for Edward, Amber, Daria and Cyprian as they plan to serve with pioneers in Poland. Father, that you give them wisdom as to when they should go to Poland and that you'll open the doors so there'll be an uneventful um, uh, coming into that country. And we continue to pray for the Christians in Nuba Mountains in Sudan, that you give them strength, help them to cling to you, and that their lives might be witnesses for you. And we acknowledge, Father, for those that are sick in our church at this time. We think of Ingrid, Angie, John, uh, Randall, and many others. We uphold them to you, Father, and pray your healing hand and your comfort will be upon them. And so we're going to close in prayer using a passage from Colossians 1, 9 to 14. And so, Father, we ask that you will fill us with the knowledge of your will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that we might live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so we might have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to share the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And with a thankful heart, we acknowledge and rejoice that you do hear and and respond to our prayers. For we ask them all in in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Cherish for eternity
It's our prayer that you've found this service to be uplifting and encouraging and that the message has been challenging to each one who has listened. Let us conclude our service by saying the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. May you have a blessed week and we look forward to speaking to you hopefully in the near future. And if you need anything, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thank you.